All right, friends, welcome back to another episode of Beyond Ag Ed. And if you thought we were done redefining the standard, we're not. We've got more more work ahead of us, and we are ready to rock and roll this morning. So, Mr. Corey Weathers, would you please introduce our special guest that we have with us? Absolutely. Today, we are joined by uh, Darlene, a.k.a. the floral boss, Gillis. Um, who I had the pleasure of working with for only one year. Um, I was, to be honest, before we get started, I was really bummed when you told us you were retiring um, because <laughs> it, it was a really good year and I learned a lot from you, but we'll talk more about that later. Um, but yeah, tell us about your career, what got you into ag education, um, you know, what kept you in the profession for as long as you you were um, we're in it and you know just and where you are now well thank you for your kind words um let's see i started i my uh progress started in high school i entered the ag program and at chachilla high school and um i had been in 4-h previously and so i took that into the uh to the high school level and entered FFA. And it was at a time where there were not very many females in, in ag period, let alone um, FFA. And uh, from there, with the help of uh, some good teachers, I, um, I decided, started focusing in on, on it possibly being a career. And uh, once I graduated, I went to Fresno State where I, uh, um, started the Ag Ed program. I took a long, kind of a, a long um, road to get into actually teaching and um, receiving my credential. I started at Fresno State. Uh, things didn't go very well um, based on the um, uh, teacher educator at the time. He had very definite ideas that uh, mm -hmm. females should not be an ag and he did not was not very uh encouraging and so i left at the end of my sophomore year at fresno state to byu where i um earned a degree in uh, animal science came back to fresno and um worked because i was poor and uh needed to couldn't afford to go back to school to get my uh teaching credential uh, ended up serving a mission for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And when I came back from that, I decided I needed to do what I always wanted to do. And that was get my teaching credential and join the ag education family. And that's what I did. So I actually was much older when I entered um, my uh, the teaching field at that time. I was 28 when I actually started teaching. So I was much older than... Uh, most of the um, students that I, I went out that was in my class uh, at that time. But yeah, I had, I had good guidance from high school ag teachers and that's what encouraged me. And what a difference, I, I have to say, as I reflect back, it was quite the difference between the encouragement of, of my high school ag teachers and the teacher educator who did everything I felt he could to discourage me from continuing on. And uh, when I returned to Fresno State for my credential, at that time, Richard Rogers, Dr. Richard Rogers was the teacher educator and he was an amazing individual. And he was so um, um, encouraging and just uh, was so open to everyone. And uh, what it, it was like a night and day difference. And so as I started my career, I, I felt like I actually had not a chance at success because he was he was there to be our um, not only mine but every other um, uh, ag students um, champion and coach. So that's how I ended up um, eventually uh, teaching. So I had a lot of good uh, mentors that helped me along the way, and um, and I have to say that when I first started again. As when I entered the ag program at, in, at the high school level, um, when I started looking for actual teaching jobs, I came up against the same kind of premise that, you know, females, you're okay. You sound like you could do the job, but 
we would feel much more confident uh, uh, hiring a man. And uh, so I had in several job interviews after the interview, I had um, people who were um, community members who were sitting on the on the panel that were inter uh, interviewing me come up and say, you know what, you did a great job. You were our second choice. But our first choice was was the guy. So it was uh, it was quite the uh, challenge at the beginning to even get a job. But once I got it, I just felt like uh, this was what I wanted to do. So that's how I got got into ag education. So I don't so, know what else. <laughs> yeah, kind of. I'm just I'm so curious because you have. Yeah such a wealth of knowledge and getting, uh, getting to not just observe, but be part of the profession for the amount of time that you did. And then I, for lack of a better word, um, during the, the, um, the time periods or, or the generations, how you've gotten to see it evolve over the last several years. Um, <clears throat> I'm curious what, like, what thoughts or opinions do you have um, having watched it go from the experience you had early on being so discouraged by the teacher educator initially, and then now looking at, at a profession that's a vast majority female. Well, yeah, when I started, maybe 10% of the teaching population were female. And at that time, there were only 600 roughly 600 ag teachers in the state of California. And so you can see, um, uh, it was not very many, many, many women. And so it was, it, it was quite the challenge and to see it slowly shift so that more and more, and now we are over 50% mm -hmm. female, mm -hmm. that concerns me because I think that we need men in education and not only at the high school level, at all levels of education it's because of uh, society, because of all of these, um, um, part families, um, uh, single, um, what do I, is it, what do I want to say? The, the ones that families that don't have a father in the home, you know, a lot of times they're only, um, uh, male contact is with a teacher and, you know, they need to see, they need to see men in, um, uh, as a role model and not and especially at the high school level see helping them make choices because i mean even as as females as as in tune as we can be in the profession and opportunities and things it kind of helps if they have somebody uh in a male role our male students especially that have um, a male figure that can help give them some guidance also and i think that that's important and uh, but uh, it's wonderful to see as many women in the profession. I mean, it was, it it was, it, it has an entirely different uh, feel. And I think one of the changes of bringing all these, uh, having so many women in the in the field now and uh, teaching is that it's made it, I think, uh, more focused on being more family friendly, because you have women who are are married with children at all different excuse me, at all different stages in their lives and with their children. And um, in, where when I started, you never saw children at um, children of, of uh, ag teachers at different events or um, meetings or even even at um, summer conference, you know, so it was like they had families, but you never saw them. And as women entered the the uh, as the number of women increased, now you started having women who had small children, babies, they couldn't leave them at home. So they had to start, you know, compromises had to be made on those, you know, weekends and, and uh, night meetings when maybe the, hus the husband couldn't take, wasn't available to take care of them. So they had to bring them with them. And so that uh, the organization went through a real uh, difficult period of time during that, um, period when children started to show up and you could feel it you could hear it from men in general with co snide comments about the, the children but at that time this needed to 
this change had to come about in order for uh, these women to continue to be successful in their careers. And we had to be more open to it. And I think that that was one of the best um, changes or shifts in mindsets because, you know, we always say that um, agricultural um, education is to be an ag teacher. It's not, a, it's not a career, it's a lifestyle. And so in order to adopt that, you need to also accept the other parts of that lifestyle and that is the family. Darlene, when you, you know, being kind of coming from that, that point in time where you were one of very, very few females and, and almost discouraged not to, to be in this profession because you were female, um, you had to have been a mentor to a lot of females moving forward. I mean, you, you spent X amount of time in the, in the profession and saw it, the amount of female ag teachers increase substantially um what do you think you know how did you help influence them and what what advice did you give to some of those ladies that were unsure and and felt like they were getting pressure from maybe the male end of side the male end of the spectrum to to not be teachers well i think one of the the hardest things about the beginning was that if you were female you had to work harder, longer, do more in order to be accepted as a good ag teacher, kind of not bad for a female. Those were comments that I would get <laughs> from, from community members and stuff where you're, you feel at times that you're working circles around everybody else when, and everybody works, at, uh, was working hard. I have to say that in the two programs I worked that everybody worked so hard and, and did their best. And so it wasn't just me, you know, doing everything, but, you know, you get that feeling that you had to do extra, that you had to do more in order to be accepted and you had to deal with those kinds of comments. And that was one of the, the issues that, um, um, that I think most females um, came upon was that they would, so they would say, I'm just working so hard. And yet everybody, you know, they come in, they go, my partner is doing half what I'm doing. That was their feeling. And they're getting all the praises and the accolades for, for just showing up. And I'm busting my fanny and, and nobody's um, acknowledging, you know, the work that, that I'm doing. And, and one of the things is you just have to say that, that at that period of time it was really hard and you didn't there wasn't a whole lot you could say because changing the mindset of the community is uh and a you know per perceived per uh, a, a perceived perspective i guess um everyone that changes so slowly you know just like the idea of accepting women as ag teachers was a slow process and as, as the numbers increase, then it became more and more acceptable. And so I think that that pressure to have to outperform or to kill yourself in order to, is what you felt like at times in order to um, validate to the community that they made a right choice in hiring you that um, um, has changed. And all I could, all of, we could say we had lots of, uh, conversations about how you handle that. And that was just, that was the hardest um, question to answer. And I still don't have an answer, you know, at that time, it was just, you just have to just keep, is just believe in yourself and just keep doing the, the best job you could possibly uh, do and hope that at some point they're going to recognize um, the changes that you brought to their particular program. You know, because every program changes with every ag teacher that comes into it, no matter how small of a change it might be, there are changes. And so people recognize that. And if it's a positive change, then they're very happy with you and everything continues on. But, you know, it's just that was that was a very hard, hard um period of time for for female teachers in the beginning is 
is how do you handle the criticism or the constant comparison to uh, to your male counterpart, you know, and and it's just there was no correct answer. You just had to be able to be confident in yourself and just say, you know what, put your head down, do your job, and do the best that you possibly can, and hope that your example and your work ethic is going to show through, and people are going to then accept you. So, I. Was, I um... <laughs> I'm like, I kept myself muted just because of course my people are starting to, you know, wake up back there. But, um, I'm, I feel like I'm constantly like nodding my head. I'm saying, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I have half a page of notes already. And something that you said a minute ago for me anyway, kind of unlocked a little bit of an epiphany or just helped me to think about things in a way that I haven't, that I haven't before. And when you were talking about some of those, you know, naysayer comments and like, oh, not bad for a female or, you know, way, way to get them, girl, you know, um, and and just that thought of having to <clears throat> having to maybe exhaust yourself and work double just for the chance of being considered or looked at as an equal and not less than just because you were female. Um, fast forward now we're in 2024 right? So much of our world, so much of our culture, our society has changed. We all went through the pandemic thing that has changed so much as well. Um, and the aha that I had is that listening, listening to you and your experience, the profession has shifted. I don't, we all know, <laughs> we all know that it's not perfect. Um, mm -hmm. but it has shifted in a lot of ways. And yet the thing that I think has stayed the same is the mindset piece, right? That we've seen so much change everywhere else, but we still have this mindset of comparison. We still have this mindset of, you know, our worth or value coming from an external, you know, um, mm -hmm. king on the hill source saying, yes, now you have done a good enough job. I will recognize you. Or now you have put in enough hours. You are allowed to like go home to your family or whatever the case may be. Um, I just, I think that's so interesting listening to the stories that you shared so far, the shift we've experienced, but we're still, we're still dealing with the same limiting beliefs and limiting mindsets that we saw maybe 10, 20 years ago. Um, I don't know. <clears throat> Thinking about your personal experience, um, and obviously I'm a mom myself, was there anything specifically that was helpful for you in managing being a full-time teacher, a mom, a wife, and making time for yourself? What, if anything, did you do? Um, is there anything you wish you would have done differently? Well, never been a wife or a mom. But one of the hardest things I ever had, and I think that that started, uh, well, it started long before I ever became an, a, a teacher, an ag teacher, but, um, but definitely when I started working and having to work what I felt longer hours and trying to do more in order to be accepted was having a balance for myself, taking time for myself. And that has always been an issue for me and one that I never really conquered uh, and I'm um, almost said oh well later on in my career I did but not really balance as far as personal and prof professional uh, life just I never found that balance and that was something that we always talked about in the beginning when more women started to enter the the uh, profession when the numbers started to going up Going up, there was this thing about, well, yeah, how do women with families and um, and children, how do they balance their careers? And so we used to have at the at at our at the summer at summer conference at the state meeting uh, a luncheon for a number of years for probably about um, I'm thinking seven or eight years women in ag luncheon in which they would bring a speaker in at the at lunch to to talk to women about um, different um, issues of, of being in a, in a high stress profession, 
how to balance time and things and, and, and that. And so, because we recognized that that was an issue for a lot of women and not just with having a family. And I don't think it's specific to women either, men too. You know, if you're a type A personality and especially in, uh, in California, in ag, I mean, everybody wants to be the best. And so you, you got, you got outside forces, your community who wants, to, who wants your program to shine. And so you're putting in all that extra time to have the best team, the best projects at the fair, um, trying to be a good teacher in the classroom. You suddenly don't have time for much of anything, anything else. And I think that the acceptance, um, one of the, things that I think has helped is an acceptance of having, bringing your children along to different events. And uh, whether it's a contest, whether it's the a livestock show, whatever it is, is, is trying to include your family so that um, you can have some family time at the same time you're still trying to do your job on all those extra, uh, extra hours that other teachers uh, don't have to deal with, you know? So as ag teachers, we have to, we have our weekends, our holidays, our summers are all taken up. Um, and so finding that balance is just really, really hard. And I wish I could have accomplished it, but I never did. Follow-up question. Um, and my apologies. I, I don't know why, but I, I had, I had assumed or, or thought, that you had been, but in, so then in your experience, because I've had coworkers, um, you know, I, I was married in the process of having kids. Right. Um, and I had coworkers at the various places that I taught where, um, they were at a different phase of life, or maybe they actively were choosing that, you know, they wanted a, a different lifestyle that didn't include having kids, which is fantastic, you know, for them. Did you ever feel that, being unmarried or not having your own children at home, did you feel pressured to do more, stay longer? Was there an unspoken expectation that because your at-home free time looked differently than other people that you had to give more than what they were giving? You know, I didn't felt that way. I was, I was really lucky uh, at Madeira everyone was in different stages. They either had adult children or they had young children as, as our department changed over the years. And I never felt like anyone made me feel as though I needed to do more because I was more available and I didn't have that. I, one of the things that helped, especially at Madeira was that as a staff, we sat down, and we discussed you know, our feelings about what our program should look like and who should be responsible for what and um, the expectations. We set down our expectations and as long as you met those, everyone was okay. And so um, everything from how many teams you should have, how, uh, what projects you were in charge of, what you needed to, what you were responsible for as far as the farm was considered. And then you had your own classrooms and the expectation for FFA meetings. We sorted all of that out. And once you do that, then everyone is aware and responsible for what they said that they would do. And then you just left it to them to do it. And with that, then there is no expectation of, oh, well, you know, you should be doing this. You should be doing more because you don't have children at home. And um, that really, you know, that really is very helpful. I have talked to, you know, throughout my career, talked to teachers who felt like they were expected to do more, you know, and because they were single. And the conversation always went back to dividing up responsibilities and making sure everybody does what they're supposed to do. And then you don't have a need for needing to do extra. Darlene, so you, I mean, you taught in two Clovis and Madeira, you know, two really difficult communities, very, very demand, not difficult, but demanding, right? That you have to mm -hmm. prove yourself there. Um, and you actually gave me a piece of advice 
when I first started at Madeira and you were like, do your job, right? Just do your job. And I, I guess I kind of had an idea of what that meant, but now it makes way more sense because, you know, and I, I don't know who was at Clovis when you were there, but that Madeira crew, right? Dave Yates, Bob Prezi, um, mm -hmm. Stan Williams, uh, Bob LaBruchery, yourself, like this group of legends, right? That built that that house, that community, um, that got that community to buy into the, the program, to the students, to the vision that you had for for what all of that looks like. Um, that do your job piece makes so much more sense now looking back because with every single person firing their cylinder all of a sudden what are you able to create and i and i really appreciated that mentality that you brought to me as a, a young teacher at that point in time um of carry your weight and if you carry your weight and i carry my weight and they carry their weight then together we will be extremely successful so uh more of a comment than a question but yeah that was just a it, it all just kind of clicked for me right there. So that was really, really a cool moment for me. <laughs> it is. And when you, when you have everybody doing their job, it makes life so much easier and you are far more successful because you can focus on the things that you want to focus on. And if you're not having to worry about, oh, did this get taken care of? Why isn't, uh, why isn't this being done? And you have to go over and you have to do it. But if you have the expectation that everybody is one, a professional, and then two, capable, a capable professional, then you should be able to give them their list of responsibilities and then walk away and just go, let me do my job, you do yours, and everything will be great. And you have a much uh, more successful program when everybody buys into that, you know, and as, at, at every point, there was only probably, um, um, I'm going to say that, you know, the open discussions with the teachers in our department meeting and, and hammering those kinds of things out and having those difficult conversations, like who should attend FF, monthly FFA meetings, you know, and who should be doing this kind of thing should it be all of us or should should all of us have a presence there or does it just need to be one or two does it just need to be the FFA, assigned ffa advisors or should it rotate or whatever and and it makes a difference when everybody is on the same page you don't have to fight that battle every month and um every year so we were really we were really blessed to be in a great department of people who who bought into, into the whole idea of sharing all the responsibility. And so everything got taken care of. And sometimes it didn't get taken care of in a timely manner, but that's okay because that was your responsibility or it was my responsibility, but it eventually got taken care of. And I think you have less um, uh, tension and um, less uh, feelings that you have to step in and take care of stuff that's not your assignment, then there's less um, less resentment. And so you have a, a more cohesive uh, program and um, happier teachers. You know, speaking of the doing your job part, I, again, worked with you for one year, but I know you did your job. And I know how hard you worked your ass off to build that floral program into what it was. Um, what got you interested in the floral side of things? Was there an existing floral program when you came to Madeira? Um, what did that look like throughout your tenure? And just Madeira speaking, I guess, but um, what was it about that that drove you to build that into that empire that it became? Well, actually, there wasn't a, a program. And it actually started at Clovis when I... Uh, when they asked for a new class, um, my actual degree, because I switched universities and, and, and left Fresno and went to BYU, BYU, you, couldn't, you could get a teaching credential in any subject except for agriculture. They had a deal with Utah State and you had to go to Utah State and I wasn't 
planning on um, teaching in Utah, so that didn't really bother me. So I got a degree in animal science and came back, picked up my, um, eventually got my uh, teaching credential, but never really taught animal science. When I was hired at Clovis, they needed a horticulture and they needed, uh, um, they wanted to, they had two big greenhouses and they wanted to fill it and um, do the work, uh, have somebody come in and, and teach those kinds of classes. So really I, throughout the time that I was at, um, at Clovis, I only taught one animal science class. Uh, everything else was um, everything. I taught ag mechanics the first couple of years I was there. I taught um, the horticulture classes. I taught, we brought in computers for the first time. I taught a computer class for, for ag. I did all kinds of an ag business class, all of those kinds of things. And um, one of the things that happened was that in the horticulture class, I taught a unit in floral and that kind of started to build and there was a lot of interest in that and the, the district um, um, let me create a class and so I started teaching floral at Clovis and then when I left there and went to Madeira it was the same thing I was hired to be a horticulture teacher so I taught horticulture landscaping all those things and um, eventually taught a unit in floral and um, they were asking for some new classes. So I proposed a floral class. They went with it. I started out with one and eventually it, um, I ended up teaching five periods of floral uh, after a couple of years and then said, well, if I'm just doing a basic. Let's, let's take it. I have enough students. So let's do an advance and move and created additional classes, creating a full pathway by, um, by the time we were done. So um, it was just a little by little and, and letting people know we were there and doing different things. And um, I don't know, it just, it just evolved. It wasn't my plan to just be a floral teacher. You know, I, I, um, I just kind of fell into the horticulture by necessity because that's what my first job required. Um, at, at Clovis was to teach horticulture, landscaping, all those kinds of classes. And it just evolved and then became very specialized towards uh, the middle of my career. And that's how I ended up uh, in floral. And I learned a lot. I mean, when I started, and that's, uh, that's probably one of the things about our profession, especially the new teachers that are come, coming out, they don't understand you're not an expert in anything. You can develop your expertise over time as you learn. But, you know, there's the old saying, um, uh, what, what a jack, person of many, what is that? A jack, jack of all trades, master of none. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's what an ag teacher, that is the definition of an, of an ag teacher when you first start. If you're allowed to specialize, like we were at Madeira, then you can become a master in your area. But um, if you are in a smaller program where you have to be the jack of all trades, you have to be that ag mechanics teacher, you have to be the horticulture teacher, you have to teach animal science or whatever. Um, it's, it's hard, it's hard. And when you first start out, even if you specialize, when you first start out, you really don't know that much. And I found myself, always in advice, Dave Yates, I did my final student teaching at Madeira and uh, Dave Yates gave me the best advice when I was first starting. He says, all you need to do right now is just be a day ahead of them. <laughs> You'll be okay. Just focus on that as I was trying to teach a, an ag mechanics class um, when I did my final student teaching. So I would study, I would, at the end of the day, I would go home and I would be up till midnight, one o'clock, studying what I needed to teach the next day and making sure I understood the material. And that was in every aspect, because one thing to have a general knowledge is another thing to have a specific knowledge so that you can answer questions and things. And um, 
I found myself is just, he said, just be honest, just be honest. If you don't know it, just say, I don't know it. And so I found that as I, as my career has gone along, when students ask me a question and I don't know the answer, I say, you know, I don't know that, but I'll go look it up for you and I'll have an answer for you tomorrow. Or you can go and look it up <laughs> and, and, and learn something on your own. But um, um, I'm trying to think, yeah. So I kind of lost my train of thought there. But uh, yeah, you just, if you're afforded the opportunity to specialize, how, how lucky you are. I mean, then you can really try and do something more than just the classroom. And that's what happened with the floral program. We were able, when they uh, finally passed the uh, school bond and was able to build the new campus, finish uh, South Campus and build the ag facility there, um, they asked me what I wanted. And I said, I wanted a floral shop to go with it because I'd like to see it ex expand and uh, be able to offer services to not only the high school, but perhaps, and also the district. So um, I have to say that uh, Madera Unified was very accommodating. They gave me what I asked for. I designed it, they gave me what I asked for, and I was very happy uh, when we made the move to South Campus because I had an amazing facility. Actually, the entire ag facility at South Campus was amazing or is amazing. I love that. Um, just that, that insight where you're sharing how it really is. It's an evolution. It's a development over time. Um, I mean, we all are probably guilty at one point in our lives or another of, <clears throat> especially when it comes to our education, you know, you get your bachelor's degree, you get a credential, um, even when people choose to get, you know, their master's or, or other degrees and certifications, it's like you finish the thing and then you want to just go get started. And I think deep down, there's this feeling of, okay, I can do it now. I can just do all the things when in reality, you're still, you're still just starting yourself. And as much as we're educators, um, you know, Corey and I talk all the time, like you, you have to remain in, in a place and a mindset of being that forever student. You know, if you're not continuing to learn and develop and become yourself and work on those different areas of expertise, um, you know, you're not going to have the same experience as, as someone like yourself. But I think that's a real challenge for some of um, the new teachers, you know, that we continue to see come out that, you know, you're finished depending on where you might have had your high school experience um, or who some of your mentors are. There could be different levels of expectation on you when you come racing out the gate and you have your first classroom. But um, I remember being so nervous my first few weeks teaching like you. I was spending so much time at night, even though it was ag biology and I knew a decent amount, I felt pretty comfortable with it. I was looking up every single term in the book. <laughs> just to make sure that there was nothing, there was no little thing that the kids were going to like catch me up on. Um, and they still tried once in a while just to see if they could get me, but, um, just a couple of fun questions thinking about, you know, your career up until this point, if you're willing to share, what was, what was maybe one of your best days? And then what was one of your worst or hardest days and what made them so? Wow. That's good. Um, I have to honestly say that, that probably my best days were when I had a lesson that I was one, happy to be and excited to teach. It happened to be that day we were going to cover that subject. And I was always happy to do it, that the students were actually engaged and and asking questions and I was answering questions and there was this give and take. Those days, you just come out and you're just like, wow, that was a great lesson. And everybody was, um, everybody was there. I was there, students were there and that exchange was just electrifying. You're just so excited moving around the room. You had energy, you felt good. Kids seemed to feel good. Everything was just on fire. Those are the best days, no matter with 
some of my best, um, I would say, accomplishments as far as, you know, if I was coaching a team and we won a contest, those kinds of um, those kinds of things, whether we excelled anywhere, the best experiences and the probably the my um, most the happiest I was always was when everything went well that day. No discipline, no nothing. Kids were there. I was there. We were just it was like the classroom was on fire. Those were my happiest moments of teaching. And then the exact opposite. When I showed up, I wasn't as prepared as I could have been. And the lesson just went flat. It was like I couldn't teach myself out of uh, out of anything. The kids were uh, weren't excited. They weren't engaged. It was just hard work the whole entire period. And to contrast that and um, you know, you have your good days, your bad days, and then, you know, just some so-so days, but, but to go from a day when you're on fire to a day where you feel like you just crashed and burned the whole, um, the whole period, those, those are the, the, the worst days. Those are the days I'd walk out going, what am I doing? I'm just the worst teacher in the whole world. I could not, I, I couldn't, forward a concept or a thought. I couldn't do anything. It was like, I just felt like I was wading through mud and, and couldn't move. Um, those were the worst days. And those were the days that I usually went home and be beat myself up for being such a terrible teacher and trying to figure out how I could, what I needed to do. And um, so that's it. Everything, those, my best and worst always happened in the classroom. There was a, I think it was like the week after I started at Madeira, that uh, pretty bad looking area where they had put the sign in front of the greenhouse mm -hmm. and it was just kind of weeds and whatnot. And uh, you were on a mission to clean that up. And so <laughs> uh, I offered to help, which looking back was the right decision. But at the time I was, <laughs> it wasn't a, it was a lot of work. It was fun, but it was a lot of work. And so, um, you know, you had decided to put down uh, AstroTurf there. Right. And I remember you saying specifically a comment. You're like, you know, I don't know how to do AstroTurf, but I'm not afraid to try. And what's interesting about that, Darlene, is there's these little quotes or moments that you get from, from these people that you think highly of. And throughout, I mean, I this was what 2018 2017 mm -hmm. so seven years ago but these little things that you remember and there's sometimes in my life and, and I know that everybody who listens to this and all three of us here sitting here can can relate there's times where we feel like we're probably not good enough to do something or we're terrified to do something because we're going to suck at it and it's interesting just again how that little comment you made um, it inspired me in a way because now when I go into a situation that I'm not comfortable with or I feel like I'm going to suck and, and that nobody likes that feeling but not being afraid to try you know your floral program became what it was because you weren't afraid to try you know your you becoming an ag teacher period happened because you weren't afraid to try and that that is such a powerful message and and that's honestly i think what what was a huge um i don't know just a huge thing for me in in this conversation like i've, I've had many conversations with you but just hearing you talk about that stuff it's just it's very inspirational and i think there's a lot of people that listen to this that are going to take that and it might just change their mentality about the way they're looking at this or that might be the thing that just keeps them in this profession one more year, right? Because yeah. things aren't going their way. So that that is so cool. You know, we had uh, uh, Susan Moran and I uh, used to pal around all the time, and uh, she was strong. She had a lot of um, a good, a great floral program herself, and um, we used to compare notes every now and then, and very similar. 
as far as our departments and as far as um, our experience, some of our experiences. And uh, we used to just look at each other because we would say, oh, I just decided to take on this um, uh, this job doing whatever it was in a in a floral uh, uh, situation and um, get in the middle of it and go, whoa, what was I thinking? <laughs> I didn't think this through all all the way. I didn't know quite understand everything that was going to be involved, and so it uh, ended up being a lot more work and harder. And but we got through it, and um, she she, um, she and I both would commiserate and go, yeah. Well, the problem is, is we think we can do it, and we get into the middle of it. We're not afraid. We're going, wow, this is going to be a great experience, and get into the middle of it and find out. Oh man, I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> I've never done this before. It's it's not as simple as I thought it was going to be. But you know, you don't give up. You don't throw in the towel. You just keep you just keep pushing through. And I did that a lot in my in my class. I would I would learn a new skill. I would see it, and I'm going, wow, that's great. This students will love it. And I would just get everything and I would show up and I'd go, okay, this is what we're gonna do today. This is brand new, it's, uh, peop it's, it's, uh, it's lighting up everywhere. Everybody's wanting this and it's a, it's a different approach on how to create this, let's do it and get into the middle of it and go, wow, I understood and I knew how to do it, but turning around and figuring out how to teach it to somebody else, all of a sudden it's like, whoa, crash and burn. But I learned a lot and and uh, and was ready for the next time that I had to teach it. And and, you know, that 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 enthusiasm for trying new stuff and not being afraid that just makes it exciting. And agriculture is a subject that you have to keep up on. It, it's not stagnant. It's constantly changing and evolving, you know, and um, if you're going to be. Uh, relevant if you're going to help your students uh, uh, pursue any uh, pathway in agriculture, you need to be as current as you possibly can. And that means you have to learn and then you have to try new things. And you have to be willing to crash and burn in front of an entire class and walk away and go, oh, that, you know, I really didn't know this as well as I thought I did, but, I'm, go back, study it again, and come back and try it all over again until you are successful and your students are going to be successful. And when they figure it out, even before you do, it that's even more amazing, more amazing. Because in the middle of it, when you're going, oh, I can't remember, how, how was it? Was I supposed to do this or that? And then they go, well, you know, look, I just did it this way. And I'd go, great, everybody look at at them they're going to show you how to get through this part that's exciting it's just i you have me excited over here and i'm not i'm like i'm not in the classroom anymore but you sure make me want to go like learn something new and then teach it to somebody um thinking thinking about where our profession's at right now all of the pain points and growth points we've been through together whether we're thinking about um you know, the funding issues that we faced historically, um, certainly the changes that we've seen in just the the makeup of the profession, you know, men and, and women and the like, um, given where you're sitting today and looking at the profession, are there any changes that you feel like could be implemented today that would help us to continue to grow both in terms of numbers, but also in terms of quality individuals that are coming in for the long haul? That's a great question. And it's a difficult question because there's, I think one of the, the problems that education in general faces is everybody is trying to make it cookie cutter. Mm. Kids are not cookie cutter. Yeah. Teachers are not cookie cutters. Okay, you can ex have lay say, okay, this is what we expect of you. But the hard thing is when you lay down specific, very, very narrowing rules on how you're supposed to do it, it, it becomes um, 
un, in many cases unrealistic because of individuals and individual personalities and styles. Your style of teaching is going to be different from my style, you know, and every, excuse me, everybody else's. Um, mm -hmm. And it's the same way with students. You look at your classroom, it's a mixture and everybody, every student is at a different level. They're coming with um, different experiences, different expectations. And so uh, that is, um, that uh, makes teaching very, very difficult. You have students who wanna be there, students who don't wanna be there and everybody in between. Mm -hmm. And um, so coming up with a, a specific plan is, is very hard. And um, as far as the profession in itself, one of the things that I saw as I was as I was preparing to exit is with a lot of the new teachers, their expectations of what the job really entailed. Mm. Um, probably one of, and this was years, this happened years before um, I left, but there was a, um, a gentleman that was doing, getting ready to do his final student teaching. And he was older and um, I was talking with him and uh, he, this was something he thought he wanted to do was be an ag teacher. And uh, as we were talking, one of the, I was talking about all the different things we were doing and our, our weekends, fairs, all this kind of stuff. And, um, but he kept looking at me and he would say, yeah, but you can go home at, at 3.30, right? Oh, you got your weekends off, right? I was, no, you don't understand. No, no. And I think that that is one, uh, one of the uh, issues that I saw as I was leaving the profession is you have students coming, uh, students, you have new teachers coming in thinking that they're going to be able to be done when the last bell rings or when their contract is up, whether it's 30 minutes after the uh, last bell rings or whatever it is, and that they're gonna be done and they're gonna have their weekends. And, and again, that goes back to um, balance, you know, and balancing your professional and your, and your personal life. Um, but in the beginning, that's really, really difficult because you have so much to learn, so much to do, and you have to work yourself into that um, thought mindset that, no, you're not going to go home 30 minutes, usually right after the bell. There will be days maybe that you can do that, but you're not, and that you're going to be gone on a Saturday, maybe several Saturdays, maybe three months of Saturdays you know, and then you might have a summer fair and you've got projects. And so you're gonna to have to be doing all this. And I don't think that they really understand all of that. And I'm not quite sure how you can help them learn that or um, understand completely what that is until you actually get into it. Final student teaching helps, but really I think that there needs to be um, something before that even before initial, because initial doesn't you know they're there just a couple hours um each week so i'm not quite sure how you can unless they have some kind of um i don't know not i don't want to call it a mentoring program but mm -hmm. something in which they go and they spend you know like a week their freshman year or their sophomore year in the um, in their career path, have spend it at a school, you know, in the middle of insanity, not, not, yeah. not right either at, you know, some time when things are, as everybody's um, slowing down for say finals or, 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 or that kind of thing in the middle of the insanity in which you're coaching, you know, three days a week after school, you got midterms to grade, you you got to check on your um, animals that are going to go to fair you're coaching you and then you got to get up at oh dark 30 in the morning meet your students and head for a contest and get home late at night so I'm not quite sure but I think that that is 
probably what I saw at mm -hmm. the time that I left, that they just really didn't understand the commitment. Well, and you're right, because by the time, by the time you get towards the end of your student teaching experience, let's be honest, you're, you're at a point of no return for a lot of people because yeah. you've been not being paid during that process. Yeah. You've got X number of years with your bachelor's degree and now earning your credential. Most people are just going to like grit, like grit and bear it and, and get through. And you're probably thinking to yourself, I've inve invested this amount of time and this amount of money, like. I'm not going to not become an ag teacher at this point, even if for some people they're seeing those red flags. It's a good point. No, is it? And it is hard, you know, as we said, as I said in the beginning, this is a lifestyle and you have, you have to be willing to accept that. And the, the thing is, is for these young teachers, and I realize that everyone, um, we do have an, a serious attrition rate with teachers, and um, I think that that might, might help, you know, something is they, they really see what it's, what it's really like to, to be an actual teacher. And maybe it needs to be longer than, probably should be longer than a week, but that they need to see what is entailed. And um, before they get to that point of final student teacher or teaching or even initial school, uh, student teaching so they can make a u-turn if they feel that that's what they need to do okay but one of the things that I was told when I start actually started teaching at Clovis one of the teachers he was actually the auto shop teacher at Clovis and a great great man amazing instructor just absolutely phenomenal but he said he said to me he said he goes, you know, you're going to come to a point where you're going to have to make a decision whether you're going to stay in education or get out. And he says, you're going to have to make that by uh, no later than your seventh year, because after that, because you're going to be making too much money to leave. And he says, you're not going to want to be miserable for the rest of your life. So you need to pay attention and, and, and really decide if this is what you want to do. And for many, as we know, they de they decide that it's not. And it is. There's a lot of challenges when you don't have supportive administration. And I've been in schools uh, where I didn't have supportive um, administration. When you have changing of administration, you know, they come in with different ideas of what's important and, and you have to deal with that. And uh, there's nothing worse than feeling like you're working so hard and you don't have the support that you need. And um, we were very blessed at, at Madeira. We had good support that just continued to increase. You know, I have to give a shout out to Cheryl Sissel. Once she made that choice to move into administration, things changed. She's a natural cheerleader. And, you know, one of the issues with that I found, especially for me, but I, I see it in other programs is you're so busy doing your job, you don't promote yourself. And so a lot of times people don't know what you're doing. They have no clue what's happening or about your successes because we don't blow our own horns. And she did that, which brought a lot of more light to our program, which excited more of uh, the upper administration up into the district office. And so we had phenomenal support and um, that makes it that much easier. It was kind of brutal sitting through those assemblies at Madero where they're like talking about the teams that won awards <laughs> and you think it's gonna be like athletics. And it's like, oh, the boys soccer team made it to second round of CIF. And then um, let's talk about agriculture and, and like all of these silver bowls, you know, meets judging yeah. first place for, you know, state finals and second at nationals and same thing with animal si vet science or floral or whatever. And it was just the looks that the ag department got and we, they weren't really favorable from the rest of the community uh in terms of teachers but the school itself had no choice but to embrace that and that was just pure like I don't know kind of a little bit of swagger I thought it was funny <laughs> well no 
And you know, most if you look around, most schools, the ag department is usually the one that steps up to to help the school out when it needs, when it has big events that it needs to do. And um, so what happens is we're thrust in the spotlight or they see that we are actually implementing all the standards that everyone expects us to do. Because for the most part, uh, ag teachers are rule followers. So if you say, this is what we need you to do, or you have to meet these things in order to do X, Y, or Z, we do it. And we don't just do it. We always put our best foot forward and do our best, which then draws attention to us. And they're going, well, look, the ag department's doing this. Look, the ag department's selling at this and they're not doing it. And they're upset because they're not doing it. And they're, and we're getting the recognition that we are doing, which shines the light on the fact that they're not doing it. And uh, so it does breed resentment and, um, and we did, we got to a point where when I left Madeira, they were, the, the teachers just would roll their eyes every time they would mention the ag department. You know, like the ag department, they're doing this, which means you guys can do it too. And so it just, you know, it's a good thing, but at the same time, it, <laughs> it can um, breed a little bit of animosity at the school, but that's okay. You know, you just go, Hey, you want to you want the light to shine on you? Then you need to step it up. Well, I know we're getting a little <clears throat> a little uh, long into our time together, but um, I definitely, Darlene, want to say thank you. And um, are there any like last tidbits or advice that you would give? Um, I don't know, maybe new teachers or someone that's nearing the end of, um, of their career or time in the classroom, any last takeaways before we close out our time together? I can tell you that my experience, uh, and this is my experience, that, that teaching agriculture was the best career choice for me. And I never regretted it. I never looked back and said, oh, I wish I'd done something else. You know, and when people would say, oh, well, if you were doing something else, you could be making more money. And I go, but would I love it? And, um, you know, despite my worst days, um, I still loved what I did. I love the challenge of meeting new students and, 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 and interacting with them. And, and again, all the teachers, um, in the profession, getting the opportunity to talk. And I think that that's one of the best things. That's one of the things that um, always used to stymie me with other teachers in the school. You know, your, your social science, your math, they didn't get together with other teachers in other districts or other, other parts of the state and compare notes, talk, share ideas. And that's one of the advantages I think we have because we have that model of section, region, and state. And we come together and you're sitting next to somebody you may not know. Next thing you know, you're talking, you're sharing ideas. You're not afraid. If you're not afraid to ask questions, you know, you share your experiences. You ask, how do you handle this at your school? And you come away with great ideas. And I think that that, that sets us apart. Um, the ag profession, and it really makes it so much easier for you when you are sharing the experience with not um, with your uh, own department, but also with other teachers around you in the state or having similar experiences and you can help each other. And we're a very helpful, helpful group, willing to, to answer questions. And that's made it so much easier for those that are get nearing the end, you know, a question I asked um, Stan Williams about 10 years before I, I retired. And I said, how did you know when it was time, that it was time for you to go? He just says, you know, you're just going to know. And at that time, I was enjoying life and I loved my classes and everything was going well. I go, I just can't see me ever retiring. But when it happened, it happened. I got that, it was just, just hit me and it said, it's time. You just can't do another year. 
as much as I wanted to. And, and so for them, just listen, listen, and you're going to know when it's your time. And um, again, it's, I've never regretted my choice of career and I've loved it. And I hope everybody else will come to that point where even in the worst of times, you know, it's the best thing for you. Well, I have a feeling um, when everybody watches this episode, whether they're at the beginning of their career or maybe in some of their final years, um, I have a strong inclination that this episode is going to, I think, inspire people and probably help them fall in love with ag education all over again. And that just speaks volumes to who you are as a person and um, so much of what you were willing to share with us today. So I just want to say thank you so much. You're phenomenal. I'm glad. Oh, <laughs> I'm glad Corey brought you in this morning. So awesome. Well, thank, you. thank you so much. I enjoy it. I enjoy the podcast too. It's, you know, I'm thinking if I was a younger teacher, this is so um, informative and mm -hmm. helpful, I think, to see different views, different perspectives. And I hope, I hope everyone more people will turn in, more teachers. And I think this would be helpful, not just for the ag community, but for kind of all teachers to realize, you know, that everybody has their um, ups and downs, that it's not the easiest thing at times, and it, but it's a, it's a great place to be. It's a great job. And it's the one that gives you the opportunity to really have an influence on the next generation, no matter how small that might be.